When you're lost in the darkness, look for the pod. Specifically, the Prestige TV podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network, where we're breaking down every new episode of HBO's The Last of Us. On Sunday nights, grab your battery and join Van Lathan and Charles Holmes for an instant reaction to the latest episode. Then head back to the QZ on Tuesdays for a deep dive with Joanna Robinson and Mallory Rubin. From character arcs to video game adaptation choices, story themes to needle drops, we'll parse every inch of this cordyceps-coated universe. Watch out for mouth tendrils and follow along on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. I need sports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, he recommends taking the tunnels to get out. It's Andy Greenwald! I, I mean, to get out of Kansas City. Yeah, killer city. I, I, I would choose any any method of escape. Oh, Greenwald, it's great to see you. What a, what a funny, funny little turn of fate that this episode of The Last of Us focuses on Kansas City. Yeah, and just sort of like how it runs itself, how it celebrates. It begins with a party in Kansas City, which stung. Yeah. Stung a little bit. Do you wish that the uh, the, the Super Bowl parade uh, for the Chiefs who just beat the Eagles last night in the Super Bowl, uh, to, uh-huh. you know, that was disappointing. We'll, we'll address that in a second. But do you, do you kind of want to see the Chiefs parade? <laughs> we'll we'll speak parade? on that. Uh-huh. Um Suffer the same fate as <laughs> Kathleen's bunch. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not gonna say just like the I open top that. bus goes down into a just, hole, and then all and of a then sudden, I would just like that long pause. You know, Andy Reid turns his head. Yeah, and a mushroom covered turn. cave troll jumps out of the ground. Uh, no, you know, I want to be a gracious loser here because that's what I think yeah. really defines being a Philadelphian. And uh, tip my cap to. Kansas City, who won that game on on merit, you know, and through graft and nothing but elbow grease and fair play. Wow. Look, I... I, Okay. Are we going to talk about this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, you know, it really stings to lose the Super Bowl. (laughs) Yeah. It's been about uh, close to 20 years since the last time you and I had the, the, the pleasure. Doesn't get better. My thing is... First of all, I just want all my sports friends to have a good time. You know, yeah. play a good game, have a good time. Sure. And for the most part, that's what happened. I understand losing. I do come from Philadelphia. So I'm, you know, broadly familiar with the contours, the emotional shape of it. It's very likely that we would have lost that game. I mean, Kansas Absolutely. City is very good. Patrick Mahomes with the ball in his hand going down the field. Like, it's come not on. like we wouldn't be the first. It's preposterous to watch that. And, you know... As they say, a game of inches, one in the trenches. You, you, you fumble it up a touchdown, what are you going to do? It did suck that some, some unelected bureaucrats... <laughs> That's right, the deep ...injected state. themselves just when our team just needed a chance to count the ballots. You know what I'm saying? And then they injected themselves into the game. I, there's a couple things here. So that was just a shitty way to end the game. I, I think I would have felt differently had the Chiefs just won. Like, which they very likely would have done anyway. 
But to have it happen like that without having a chance to come back, without seeing Jalen getting really get a chance with the ball in his hands, that was a major, major bummer. Now, speaking of major bummers, I did make a strategic error after that. I was a little bit um, inflamed. Mm -hmm. I was upset. I'd had a few loggers. Yeah. And also more than a few of Doritos new spicy sweet chili flavor. So that wasn't SpawnCon on your Instagram? I wish it was SpawnCon. I needed to provide for our friends Zach and Amanda. And I was like, what can I, a 45-year-old man, do for them who have done so much for me this football season? And the answer was buy three bags of Doritos. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> Did anybody else party. eat them or is it just you? No comment. Okay. I think, no, uh, Zach's sister, Ruthie, shout out Ruthie, a great Eagles fan and person, uh, did support me in the Dorito consumption. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is that I, I did something that I never do anymore and I, and I tweeted. I regret tweeting. What I wanted to tweet was, losing happens, but what a shame for the referees to unnecessarily inject themselves into the narrative at the end of what was otherwise a sterling contest that everyone could walk away from with their heads held high. Too many characters. So I didn't. A little pithy. Well, you Good gotta job, pay refs. for Twitter blue and then you could just let it rip, man. <laughs> my my issue was I just kind of forgot. You know what I mean? And yeah. I forgot that if you tweet anything, the response is kind of like what's happening underneath the streets of fictional Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> and within seconds, I was inundated with people being like, drown in your own tears, shitbag. <laughs> so I was like, Okay. I think you might need to tweak your filters a little bit because there I, is some things you can do to make it a little bit more inhabitable. It, it, it's 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 fine. It's yeah. fine. I, I I walked away. That was that was my own mistake. Um I it was it, it was it was a bummer. It's a bummer because I love this team. There will be another hurt season. And uh, you know, we move on. The real problem is the void in my life now. I'm gonna have to start watching more TV shows for this podcast <laughs> because I, <know. laughs> I, I got in the car this morning and it was so silent. Because I am not going to listen to sports content for one to twelve. Yeah, weeks. you're more aspirational. I don't think I don't think yeah. of you as someone who's like, let's sort through our feelings after this loss. Kind oh, of thing. also let's let's crush tape. Yeah, and, and like learn from this. No, 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 no. Emotionally, no. So that was a bummer. I uh, sadly could not be there uh, at the Super Bowl party, uh, as you may be able to detect from my voice. Your boy has contracted the novel coronavirus. Uh, you know, it turns out that it's a shock. Extensive time spent in London pubs and at Premier League matches and having people scream in my face. Uh, not that it was their fault, you know, whatever, but like I, I got COVID. So I had like this weird feeling coming back where I was like, I, and it turns out that was COVID, but I had a weird <laughs> feeling that, <laughs> that this something like this was going to happen, that there was something like weird to this game. Like, and then when I saw like the, little bit during the Super Bowl where it was like the last couple of Super Bowls at this fine stadium in Nowheresville, Arizona have actually been decided with like these hysterical endings with like, I think it was the Malcolm Butler interception and the helmet catch were also Glendale, uh, Glendale Super Bowls. So it's not surprising to me that it was a little bit of Look, it's also Maricopa County, Chris, right? Which as you have, and we just long can't be sure. Arguing, I just want to, I want to go back through and hand count this game. Chris, first of all, salute to you. This is this is a legendary pod performance from you. You sound great. Thank you. You look great. I, uh, it's remarkable. This is Chris. I mean, remember, this is just a testament to the efficacy of the J and J shot because the fact that you <laughs> danced with the devil, and by the devil I mean England, three <laughs> times. Yeah, third time was just, the charm. It just skated is really a testament to your heroism and your bravery. I also feel like your version of the novel coronavirus is kind of like a high ankle sprain on Patrick Mahomes, which is like something that could cripple Where, lesser you, men. You think I'm playing it up to get like the drama going a little bit? No, I'm just like, like that you ankle apparently sprain? you're just stronger than most people. Yeah. Because yesterday I was like, buddy, I'm going to I'm going to arrange a, a sub, you know, to, to, to step in because I don't want you to be I want you to focus on your health. I just want you to focus on getting better. And you were like, absolutely not. And the call I made to Ndamukong Su saying like, your services won't be necessary after all. <laughs> he must have been pretty disappointed. Didn't go great. Yeah. He's like, I've, I've put in my retirement papers. I'm going to be joining <laughs> the watch. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bummer. No, a bummer. I couldn't miss out. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit. We could just do a little bit of like a light breeze through. Now, I know our listeners may not. 
what it's like to watch sports with you, which is to say, Mm -hmm. I think that you grip the wheel a little tight, especially during (laughs) the big games. So were you even able to enjoy any of the ads or Rihanna's performance or, or the flash trailer or anything like that? Yes. Shockingly. Yes. I, there was a moment when I turned to many members of the the Baron family and I said, you know, I wish they had invented a better alcohol, one that makes you feel good. <laughs> because I felt super just like, I, I had like, just the body wasn't good. Like the nerves were too high. It didn't feel great. But broadly speaking, the ship was on course. You know, the road was straight. It was fine. I was able to enjoy it. I very much enjoyed the Rihanna halftime performance. Yeah. I also, you know, we did have a 10 point lead at that moment. Um, so we had a 10 point lead and we weren't sure if Pat Mahomes could walk and it turns out he could. And the night turned on that. Yeah. I also, I don't want to name names, but there was someone uh, from Philadelphia who texted me at halftime and said, will you come home for the parade? Ooh. And I was like, that is, I didn't even, when, when Mahomes got hurt, I just said, I think I just sent an ellipsis to Zach. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't even, yes. I was like, we're not going to talk about this, but I do feel like we could beat Chad Henney, you know? And then I was also kind of in my mind gaming it out where it's like the Eagles never played anybody because they yeah. got, you know, they knocked out Brack Purdy, they had Daniel Jones, and then they get like See, a quarter and a half of, of, uh, of Pat. <laughs> but, you know. I also reject that because we did play those people. We just destroyed their <laughs> ulnar nerves. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, that's playing them. Yeah, I know. When you tackle them so hard they can't throw for six to eight months, like, that's playing them. And the resulting win is because it's the we Philadelphia them. way. I know. I, I, I don't, I reject that wholeheartedly. Yeah, I, 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 but I did, I did take in all the content and Daddington Island. I, I did feel some pride that I was able to model slightly emotionally normal behavior for my children. By being like, that was disappointing, but let's read a story. Like, it, it was, oh, that's it was good. okay. That's big yeah. of you. Yeah. It, 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 you know, the other thing is, we've won one before, which is nice, and we, we've lost one. So, <laughs> the sun rises on Monday. Um, let me try to, think, try to think of some highlights of the non-football evening. I have to say, I was quite moved by Chris Stapleton's <laughs> national anthem. Maybe not to the level that, uh, that Nick Sirianni was, but I do believe I texted you Stapleton goading <laughs> like right now. <laughs> you did? Yeah. You did. Uh, I, weirdly, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene texted me the same thing right now. That after was disappointing you. for me when I checked Twitter to see what the vibe was on the Stapleton. In, in your N- defense. Natty Anth. I and mean, it was just like Marge, like... <laughs> That's how you fucking do it. No more woke politics in my Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, in your defense, you didn't follow up that text by saying so much better than all of the non-white people in yeah. the stadium right now. So I think you're okay. That was that was a nice opening. So I enjoyed that. Stapes. And then, yeah, like the ads were the ads. I, I continue to be a little bit mystified by what, what Adam Driver's doing out there. Uh, I got to talk to you about Adam Driver because I guess he, he's also in some sort of like Roland Emmerich movie that they shot years ago. Yeah. But I, I didn't understand. I mean, maybe you talk, help me out. Until yesterday, as you know, I wasn't really on Twitter and never going back. But my vibes of Adam Driver was very much, I did Star Wars, I regret it to my bones, and now I'm only working with people who have been in contention for the Palm Door. And then we see him like fighting dinosaurs and doing ads. And I guess... My only takeaway is that he loves art, but he also loves money because private school tuition in Brooklyn is sick. I sincerely, first of all, like it's expensive to be alive. Yeah, Second of I all, begrudge him. You know, he's like he is doing the Francis Coppola movie, which like has had to turn over its entire staff, like out in Atlanta, and staff turnover. Uh huh. He seems deeply involved in that, so I wonder whether or not he's kicking a little of that Squarespace change to oh. to Copes, you know, to That's to nice. finish finish his dream project. I, that's just speculation on my part, though. Um, I'm trying to get the other ads. They were all pretty well, like your usual. I'm surprised, I guess, by just like the sheer volume of quote unquote movie stars who are just like. This is what I mean. I am I, in an ad, like from Bradley Cooper to Will Ferrell to Melissa McCarthy. Like you know, we we broke the seal on that a long time ago, mm-hmm. but I haven't like seen a Melissa McCarthy movie in like five years. You know what that's, I mean? Like that, it's that's probably why she's, she's doing, doing the ads. Bucket, I, yeah. I I just I mean, get get paid. Everything's expensive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Supply yeah. chain issues, inflation, whatever. It's it's where you we're and at, I can only but... wish to be sponsored by Doritos. You know what I mean? Like I mean, it's like we're we're not judging that crunchy 
flavor that f- satisfies. Oh, okay, Is crunch a flavor? I know. I wasn't ready. I wa- sponsor me, please. <laughs> when I love the taste your product. makes it crunch. Mm. My- <laughs> Why, am I, why do I sound like the 40-year-old virgin talking about women's bodies? <laughs> I know. Mmm, the triangular shape. Uh, really, really stings the top of the mouth. Um, I, I just remain mystified. Like, there's certain things, and we, we, people who have listened to the podcast for a while know, like, you know, when there's, like, Godzilla movies or other things that I just don't get, and they're uh-huh. popular, and I do my, you know, old, slightly older man shaking fisted cloud thing. I just... I just don't get what focus group demo work gets you the two guys from Scrubs and John Travolta singing. Like I what what is that? Like what what is the purpose of this? What is the shelf life of this? What is it selling? Whereas I still think extremely Don Draper voice, John Hamm was in a commercial too. Like the ad where the people are just dancing to that weirdly alluring hold oh, yeah. music. The Pepsi the Pepsi ad. Yeah. That's a good ad. They're dancing to the hold music, yeah. I love that. That was a good ad because yeah, it, was good it was clever. Ad. It was fine. You know what I mean? Like, I wh- when did we when did we as a country stop innovating <laughs> and making ads like that? That's good. That was a good ad. Can I talk to you a little bit about the Flash trailer? I want to talk about all these movie trailers because it was an interesting interesting array. Yeah. Um. So not a big DC fan. Mm-hmm. Skeptical about a movie that's been in seemingly in in the works for nine years. Yeah, I didn't uh, know that Andy Muschietti was directing it. I, I guess he's been directing it for two of the last 10 years, but that's cool. Obviously, you've got a very rocky runway going there with uh, Ezra Miller. Mm-hmm. And just generally, it was like it was like pretty low expectations on this. That trailer looked sick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, it did. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, I that mean, all you got for me? <laughs> oh, but I, let me point out, just yeah. one more thing. We can do this. We can do uh we can do Ant-Man and we can do this and then we need to do a moratorium on on the on multiversal. The entire thing is I've made a huge mistake by trying to save someone Whoa. or correct something in my life and now have unleashed Zod on an unsuspecting group of people and have to go running back in time to fix it. Like we've got it. Like that's not a good thing to do. No one has ever successfully fucked with the multiverse you know, without huge consequences. I think now we need to, we need to go fight in space again. I I wonder if part of the reason why we're responding to this, well, first of all, you're right about low expectations. Like that this looks decent at all is pretty shocking. And kudos to everyone involved in rehabbing every aspect of this movie, including the stars really, really impressive run of criminality over the last year and a half. But maybe the other reason why we kind of like it is because they were like, Okay, but what if we did Spider Man again? Yeah, like what if we just made that movie, but then put in a little um, End Game? Like those things work. Those are story beats that work, and we get it. And why not? Why not? Like it. It does seem like there was pretty good thinking behind a lot of it, as it seems to have a spirit of fun. This is incredibly maybe small sample size, but like you and I are not particularly interested in the machinations of the DCU, but I felt included in this. This felt like something yeah. I'd want to see. <laughs> I um, felt included. I did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't. That's not the case with Zack Snyder trailers. It seemed, uh, it seemed merry. It seemed like a good time. Now, I do have to do the old man shaking fist to cloud thing only to say, when the Spider-Man, and when I say Spider-Man, I mean uh, No Way Home, the last uh, of the, the, the last movie from last year. Yeah. It was essentially this movie. <laughs> Uh, first, two things. They didn't burn Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield in the trailer. Everybody kind of knew that was going to happen, but they did not ever make a thing about it. So theoretically, that was not a selling point unless you were like deep in the webs and the the, the coming soon hype about it. Even if they had, those movies came out within the last 20 years. And so ostensibly, some of the like coveted demo has some feelings about those characters. Michael Keaton's Batman came out when we were 12. I know. I bought, I've said this before on the podcast. I was so obsessed with this movie and so excited for this movie that I bought the Prince Batman soundtrack on compact disc and I didn't have a CD player yet. But I was like, this is such an important cultural touchstone that I will need it to live in digital format for generations. So yeah, we're like, cool, Keaton's back. That's fun. But 
do you think the kids like like the euphoria kids are they like nice the vulture is batman do you know what though they need my guy from dope sick is i think they need to have a big tent on this one like and I, i don't think they can like I don't think it can be narrow casted to like, I, as you're saying, the euphoria kids. Are those people actually going to superhero movies in the first place? What you They're need is busy. people like us to be like, yeah. that's that's my Batman. I remember that guy and going to <laughs> that's it. That's my Batman. No, but like, I mean, I, I have not really yeah. willingly watched a DC movie in several years and we'll yeah. definitely go see this in the theater. Not because of Michael Keaton, but because it actually seems like a pretty compelling story that even you're right. Did they give away a couple of the tricks? Maybe. But if you're DC, can you really afford to be like, guess what? Henry Cavill's in the post credit sequence. Like, no, you kind of yeah, have to I, have the hitters on stage I, when you when you come on. I, I yes, I, I I agree with that. I also think that for industry watchers like like the two of us, just avid avid industry watchers, some of the the tells in this trailer suggest a smarter strategy and a firmer hand at the wheel. Not as firm as my hands on the watching live sports wheel from your earlier analogy, but pretty firm in that. I believe Michael Keaton's return as Batman was initially supposed to happen in the Batgirl movie that got shelved. Yes. And this does seem like a correct read of the room and of the assets and valuations of things to be like, why are we burning that on a non-canonical direct-to-streaming movie when it's going to be the centerpiece of our Super Bowl ad if we play this right? Right. A and then B, and we'll you know we'll have more opportunities to talk about this in the next year or two. But it does feel like like Jim Gunn and Peter Safran's coup de grace here. Like they're they're like they're is saying yes, all that other stuff is in the past now, but the Flash is crucial to what we're doing. And they have definitely gotten into the edit. I'm sure they've shaped some things so that this movie suddenly retroactively does have stakes because yeah. it's the last one of that version of the DC universe. And it's going to build into something else. And they've, it was such a smart move to be like, after a a year or two years of, of the powers that be de-emphasizing, de-greenlighting, undoing things to be like, no, we're going to lift this up and make this essential to what we're doing. And it felt important because of it. I don't really have a lot of thoughts on fast movies. I have no thoughts. Uh, So we can skip that one. If you guys thought I haven't seen Yellowstone, just wait till you hear. (laughs) Do you have any thoughts, speaking of Yellowstone, on the Fox Nation streaming uh, (laughs) programming lineup? Just felt like it was made for me. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I was just like, hit after hit, like gut failed, gut field. I actually don't think I'll ever watch the Kevin Costner documentary because that way I don't ever have to know what he's photographing with a long lens. Like he's just like, (laughs) Here, like he's like, yeah, it's about to happen. I'm like, what are you looking at? <laughs> like, is it bison or is it? <laughs> Listen, there is no Costner slander on this timeline because this is a dude who is the star of the most popular show on television, and his response was to tell the powers that be, "Great, I would like to work one week on yeah. this season of television." Yeah, I, I'm. I will just say that I'm okay with this. Like, I'm okay with this. Meaning, I think it would be actually pretty brilliant if they figure out a way to in season whatever pivot Yellowstone I have like a weird sneaky in the back of my mind idea about it moving essentially to Texas Mm -hmm. Uh, now they they couldn't keep calling it Yellowstone I guess or maybe they could get away with it but there's been all this stuff in the show itself where it's just stuff happening at the Four Sixes ranches which is in Texas which Taylor Sheridan is now a part owner of where he bases all of his creative like output from and all the other people on Yellowstone are probably like I'd like to still keep being on Yellowstone and if Matthew yeah. McConaughey Texas rancher bought the Yellowstone I don't know I mean there's something there where I'm like you could do this and it would be one of the most incredible mid-air pivots of a blockbuster show that I can I can actually remember not since uh Shelley Long to uh Kirstie Alley. But this isn't just going to be like, oh, James Spader took over in the office. It's like, no, what if they like move this show to a, yeah. I'm pretty interested in this. We Chuck and I mentioned this last week, but we didn't really cover it. And I do want to, there are a couple other trailers I did want to hit, but just to say, this is an interesting restatement of the mediums because TV has never really been a star driven business. It's been the show or the setting, the hospital and ER or whatever. And we've talked about this in various contexts over the years. Um, Paramount strategy of Taylor Sheridan doing everything 
and using his Rolodex or and Bob Bakish's slush fund to like only get giant movie stars to be in these shows has been really interesting test for what streaming entertainment ought to be. But this feels like the power being asserted on, I don't want to say correct like I agree with this, but on probably the, the side that makes the most sense, which is stars aren't really that important to this. Yeah. It's a nice draw, but it's not it's not what matters. This also most, isn't especially since season stars are just two. in commercials all the time. It would be one thing if this was season two. This is season, what are we on? Five, six, like five. A, a five. I mean, like this show is like, there are a lot of scenes where you're like, uh, I guess, I guess KC was just available for some interiors today. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, he's just like sitting in a chair and like getting a st- steady stream of visitors. And there's also like weird, like the way it's kind of locked into like, certain people only do scenes with one another and then they don't, there's not a lot of like, so does this guy ever talk to his brother? Like that doesn't happen. Like it's that got that late show kind of um, static feeling that I hope they break out of. Cause I still really like think that there's a lot of like fun in this story, but they've arrived at a kind of weird end point where nothing can really change about the people. It's like when you get to in a company where it's like, you can't get promoted anymore. You know what I mean? So like, unless they want to just take like, Casey and make him the villain or something. You know, like they kind of have to lose Dutton at a certain point. So I thought you were talking about HBO for a second. No. What other trailers did you want to hit before we get um, to The Last of Us? Guardians of the Galaxy, number three. I, L- I'm a, a little Jim. confused. Jim, Jim just slinging it around. Jim Gunn, generous. Generous with the art. Um, I, I'm a little confused because I did see a Guardians of the Galaxy trailer that had Drax sitting on a couch. And then I went online to like make sure that I saw it and it was just a full trailer. So maybe that was the thing where they were like, here's a commercial for the trailer you can watch if you go online. So forgive me if I've Did you have to scan here. a QR code to find that full trailer or were you good? I had to scan my retina, which I willingly <laughs> gave to Kevin Feige in 2015. Um, I, 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 I definitely don't have notes about this. I thought that looked, I thought it looked great. I just, I, I, I feel like, again, the way the emotional tenor and like valence of the, the storytelling he likes to do you can we can laugh and we like to do director bullshit about stuff but like we when he's like the quotes about this movie he's like i'm so thrilled that i was able to finally bring closure to the um nebula arc that i began in 2014 and i'm like <laughs> kind of bullshit but also he truly believes it and the trailer's delightful i like these characters i like these actors i like that they are already all saying they will never do this again right so we'll have some real weight to it seems super fun pratt's got to do terminal list season two brother he, he, he's been, he's booked <laughs> do you think pratt will appear in the taylor kitsch prequel can he? uh yeah definitely uh the the, the ben prequel from terminal list uh, i wonder ben, ben ford how long do you think pratt how long will star lord continue to show up at like certain points in other Marvel movies and do the thing with like his earpiece that makes his mask go over his face and then shoot so that lasers. he can then leave Atlanta and someone yeah. else can do his scenes. Right. Right. A lot, a lot more often than, <laughs> than it used to be. Um, okay. Should oh, we get indie? In? Do you want any other indie things? Do you, oh, like- and, you know, the indie thing is like, it, when, when I, I, I have been kind of a little skeptical of this, despite the fact that I think James Mangold's like kind of one of the most reliable filmmakers working. Uh, I think that there was something about the uh, obviously needed since Harrison Ford is a very old man at this point with all due respect needed digitized stunts set pieces thing with like part of the appeal of those first three films is the feeling if not the authenticity of this guy really jumped from a motorcycle to a truck or from a horse Mm into like a truck and like they're having a fist fight and it looks real like there is a certain uh, I don't know authenticity to it and just then the, the the stuff i've seen so far from the dial of destiny looks a little bit more green screened or a little bit more cgi that being said when uh phoebe bridger phoebe, phoebe bridgers when phoebe waller bridge is like incredible i'm here to rescue you dr jones i was like this could work you know this could really work yeah. I also love that they're like you know there's a screenwriting term where it's just like hang a lantern on it like yeah it's like really if people are going to talk about it like let's steer towards it steer into the skid and so like having Harrison Ford involved with an airplane incident does feel <laughs> like right. they're owning it <laughs> that's right you know like it's kind of like you two with the sphere like the, the Octung Baby spy balloon concert yeah we're just going back to that so yeah. I, I 
yeah, I mean, I I will continue to feel like this Indiana Jones movie is a good idea because it's Phoebe Waller Bridge and Boyd Holbrook and like they were they went after it. So yeah, okay, seems fine. <sighs> Let's do last. Oh, last. Wait, wait, can I just do one last thing? Yeah, there was an ad for a, um, you know, a lot of startup commercials as usual, like website stuff you never heard of. There was one for. Let me get this right. The what Walt was the Disney one that was company. just like scan this code for free gift? I, I don't. I and don't it was do like I was, two animated like ninjas were like fighting in front of it. I, go ahead. What were you gonna say? I, I, I was stress eating barbecue at that point. I really can't confirm or deny whether I saw that commercial. Okay. Just this this the, the small company, the Walt Disney Company, had an ad. Oh, uh, the one hundred years of of W. Yeah. And I was interested. Like, okay, Bob's back. What is what is what is Bob saying? The Disney Company is it as it reaches its centennial. And you know what there was a lot of that I feel like maybe they put into this, like maybe this ad was done six months ago, but they left a couple couple seconds blank in case something really popped off. A lot of Navi, a lot of Avatar. Yeah. Avatar is like Disney. Disney's like, yeah, we, one of us. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like in the lead up to that movie, it's not like they, look, they spent billions making this once or continuing to spend on it even after they, you know, acquired all the Fox assets. But maybe I'm misreading the room and have, for the record, not at all seen this movie. But it did feel like in the lead up, it did feel a little church and statey. Right? Oh, like this I, isn't part of the Walt Disney Company. I did not identify this where, as a Disney film yes. until it made $2 billion and Bob, it's, Bob Iger that's was what like, I'm saying. we did it again. It's like but Princess that's kinda, Elsa, wasn't that sort of how the, Marvel, the early Marvel movies kind of worked out where it was like, Iron Man, let's, let's kind of slow roll this out there and see what happens. As far it as it being Disney a Disney then. film, oh, it wasn't. No, it it uh, that the first movie was Marvel financed itself and then Paramount distributed it. Oh. And it was like that through the first Avengers movie, which is around when I believe Disney took full control. I, I definitely do not have that timeline ex- exactly accurate. Well, you've always been a Perlmutter guy, so I, I understand why that's a little bit foggy <laughs> for you. There's one guy <laughs> who just aligns with me both yeah. creatively and politically. It's Ike Perlmutter. And, and also so, in terms of investment strategy and board seats. A million percent. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounders. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare now, only on Netflix. I'm chomping at the bit to talk about The Last of Us. I can't Uh, wait. I can't wait. If if it even needs to be said, this, this show has the belt. I feel like every single person, I have not ever, I've not heard a convincing this show isn't good argument. I've heard people make arguments against certain aspects of the show, but nobody is like, I'm not entertained and it's dumb. You know what I mean? Like, or whatever. Like, I, it feels to have almost universal approval rating, if not like skyrocketing, like I'm going to name my child after Ellie. I love this point. Uh, we can do, do you? I thought it was generic, but thank you. No, I think reasonable <laughs> people can disagree reasonably, right? Yeah, right? And there are many things to nitpick about this show. 
and uh, we will. And our particular nits might not be the same ones that other people might pick. But I think that it is inarguable that this is an extremely well-made show yeah. that is succeeding on its own terms. And um, it's an interesting example of like, I don't want to get ahead of this take because I want to let the season play out. But and it also sounds bizarre considering this is a mushroom zombie apocalypse show based on a video game brought to you by the creator of Chernobyl. But this feels like a weirdly current like four quarter entertainment like all four quadrant not quarter yeah. like in the sense that like a lot of different people can find a way into the show and to find something to like even if they don't like the horror part or they don't like the vi- whatever it, it's well done I, yeah. I i keep being impressed by that i keep you won't pe- you won't be surprised to hear this like the skepticism filter does start to settle in over me when i sit down to watch the episode and then it goes away my one issue with the episode is obviously I I know it was available all weekend on HBO Max, but uh, I wanted to I waited till after the Super Bowl to watch it, yeah, and uh, was in a somewhat altered mind state by just sheer disappointment, <laughs> and was kind of like, well, what I really want to do is sort of lightly check out the reaction to the game on online while Last of Us is kind of also mm. on, but because a majority of the first half of this episode is in sign language. <laughs> <laughs> I would be like reading Ben Solak's Twitter and then be like, wait, what the fuck is happening in this show? <laughs> so maybe, you know, I had to dial it in. And when I dialed it in, you know, mm-hmm. you're saying like your skepticism sometimes rises in the beginning of these episodes. I just, you just getting completely sucked in. Uh, and I thought the, in the same way that episode three became this um, beautiful portrait of Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett's characters. I thought Kayvon Woodward, Woodard, who played Sam, and Lamar Johnson, who played Henry, just did an incredible job. They're great. Carrying this whole entire episode. And, you know, I'm not too, uh, too big to admit that even though every part of my McBain education told me mm-hmm. that when, uh, when Henry is like, I'll tell him tomorrow. New day, new start. And I was like, just doesn't doesn't feel like we're going to get to tomorrow. I wanted to believe. I wanted to believe that these these two were going to be Listen, on the journey. Yeah, I do think that the show has been pretty insistent that there are only two two of them are the last of us. You know what I mean? Like, you don't see like the found family shit in the posters or in any of the vibes of the show. But it did play against convention in some really smart ways. Um, among them, teasing that we're going to be expanding this group. Yeah. Focusing on the interpersonal human stuff so exclusively for the majority of the episode that you almost forgot that you're in a mushroom zombie apocalypse dystopian drama until you definitely didn't forget that. It's very smart in the, if I may, in the play calling of how it it handles a lot of these circumstances. The thing that I was really struck by in this episode is the, what feels like the authorial weight and interest and intention, which is to say, and I I could be totally wrong about this. Other people's opinion about this may be different because I am, as everyone knows, not suffused in the genre. Like I do not spend a lot of time in this world. Um, But it feels like Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann and the other people on the creative team are focusing the majority of their intentions on the human and living moments. So that when you get to what the fuck scenes, like the the giant multi-pronged battle yeah. in the traffic jam in the Missouri suburbs or wherever they are at this point, there was some stuff there where I was like, what's the choreography here? Where are they standing? Yeah. They're hiding behind the car that's in front of her so that when he stands up, they'll be able to look at each other and then she runs away, but she runs away towards the house so that she can, you know, like little stuff like that. But the fact that those were the nits I was picking made me happy, if this makes sense, because I don't believe those things mattered. And hopefully if you enjoyed the episode as much as I did or more, you didn't even notice that stuff. Because what they focused on was the conversations before and after and the emotional stakes of it. And that made you forgive the other stuff. And I can just imagine, I don't want to create a straw show argument here, but I do feel like there are other brain trusts with material like this who might spend so much time focused on the actual action scene balletic choreography of where everyone is and who's attacking who and what it looks like that you forget or you don't have the resources to devote to Melanie Linsky giving a speech, for example. I think that there's a little bit 
and again, like I have played a lot of video games, maybe nothing exactly like Last of Us, which is supposed to be sort of this unique achievement in video games, but I've played video games where you are being attacked by zombies. So I'm familiar with some of the dynamics and there is an element to it where there is like, um, I don't know, not an indestructibility to your character, but like, since you can, you can start over or, you know, save the game or do whatever you need to do. Like in that action scene, that didn't bother me as much because it, I, I think I was more familiar with like, there's craziness running like all around you, but you can be safe if you just make left, right, left, right moves. Right. I, do you want to talk about the action scene first, or do you want to kind of talk about the be the first first half? Because one of the things I was going to mention to you mm-hmm. when you talk about the authorial weight to it, and what different brain trusts would do, and I, I have been thinking about Last of Us in connection to Andor, in connection to Chernobyl, because this is the conversation that we've been having over the last couple of months, is that the Tony Gilroy version of this show probably would have spent a much longer time getting into the Fedra resistance, this guy who was Kathleen's brother who was a great man Kathleen's rule nothing. yeah right and I was curious for you after coming out of Andor where it's just like you just get this fine tooth comb pu- pulled over all of the details of the show and you're just like I feel like I know every single thing mm-hmm. about every single object in this shot about every person in this scene I just have a sense of where they are who they are where they've been and then in this it's a slightly more limited POV in that these people are getting some screen time. Like you get Melanie Linsky's uh, safe box speech. You get this, you know, sort of uh, digression with, with Henry and Sam. But for the most part, the emotional part of the show is coming through the Joel Ellie prism. Do you, do you find yourself longing for more details or more background about what's happening? It's a great question, and I think it's a testament to Mazin and Druckmann that they know the show they're making, and they're not making Andor. And I think what I mean by that is one of the luxuries that Tony had on Andor is it's the prologue to something, not just to Rogue One, but to Star Wars, you know, the the original Star Wars trilogy that matters so much to us and so many other people. And so when you plant the seeds of a rebellion, there's no aspect of it that's as we've learned, no aspect of it is uninteresting because you know what it's in service towards and where it's going and the stakes and you can kind of feel that and you can invest in it in a different way. This show isn't about the end of our world and it I assume because, you know, three seasons, it's not really about the creation of the next world. It is about these two people journeying from the end of one thing to the beginning of another thing. And because of that, the amount of time spent in each one of these way stations feels really appropriate. And I think it also speaks to like the tastefulness with which we've seen glimpses of previous moments, whether it's the Indonesian scientist or whether it's even the few days before Joel and Ellie arrived in Kansas City. You know, I think we're getting we're getting an appropriate we're getting an appropriate amount. And what's interesting, five episodes in, uh, on the podcast last week when you were away and 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 Chuck came on, he was asking me why I always use the term earned or unearned when it comes to to television. And one of the things that I was thinking of was just the, the, the feeling of safety and confidence you have when you trust the driver. Um, yeah. And yeah. five episodes in, I trust the drivers of this show. I trust them to be showing me interesting, compelling, surprising bits of information, but also the right amount of information, just as now I trust them to do something. And we'll get to this, but the ending of this episode is absolutely horrific. Much more horrific than any monster that comes out of the ground. And I trust these, I trust the driver. I trust that the, the, I trust for what they put on camera and what they leave is just sound. What they play off of Ellie's face, I trust that. You know, yeah. and, and I think that's that's a remarkable thing. I thought that the ending was remarkable, especially uh, Mar Johnson's performance in in that moment where he is makes a split second decision to kill his son. Uh, that also the what did I do had that he sort of repeats over and over again has so much resonance because he obviously made this instinctual decision to protect Ellie. That instinctual decision is also the thing that he did to protect Sam, which meant ratting out, you know, this, mm-hmm. this great man of, of, of Kathleen's brother. And that had a series of consequences. And it just immediately ties into Kathleen's being, you know, her statement about you can't escape fate. And this idea that there is some sort of, I mean, in, in no way karmic, but that there is like this repeating of, 
of you know you, 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 these moral calculations that these people are making in this world that inevitably wash back up on their shores. I just thought it was astonishing, and it actually because it, it had that depth kind of offset the obvious horror of what we were watching. It's an incredibly dark argument that the show is making because I think we are accustomed to examples of the brightness of humanity in the darkest hour of, to quote someone who's been in the news recently, the possibility of finding love in a hopeless place. That one or two good people behaving the way good mortal people should can somehow be a beacon and affect change despite the circumstances or, or is worth it, whatever that means, right? And I think that this episode sketched out a pretty devastatingly pessimistic future where Henry has made a series of choices that are kind of correct, right? Like in terms of you know, if, if you wrote into the, the ethicist in the New York Times magazine, like he is you know, putting the health and safety of his child first. He is, in that case, he's putting the health and safety of another child. Like, he, he, you could you could make the case in the Albert Brooks defending your life afterlife yeah. of this. And yet, where did it get you in this world that is essentially over, where there is nothing? And that it, was, it's grimy. I also want to talk about where it got Kathleen. Mm -hmm. I got some hard-hitting questions here. Uh, yeah. Her... Jeffrey Pierce, who plays her her special ops sidekick kind of guy. And Linsky's great in this show. But I, I just want to know, like, what's Kathleen's platform? Sure. When she's going around voter to voter and saying, uh -huh. like, I should be the leader of Killer City's resistance organization, essentially your de facto duke overseeing these lands. Mm -hmm. And she just seems like a one-issue candidate. You know, where mm -hmm. she's just like the most important thing is avenging my brother's death and kind of lets everything else sort of cook, sometimes literally, where mm -hmm. you got people being dragged through the streets with butter knives all over them. We've got some pretty violent assassinations taking place. What is what is she delivering on that he's just like, you changed everything? It's like, well, so she changed everything, I guess, by having like this like truth and reconciliation program that was pretty violent, right? I think... Listeners of this podcast have a long memory, and they know how much time you spent in the fall going over Carrie Lake's position papers. <laughs> and so the fact that you're now pretending to be ignorant of what a governorship would have looked like. You know, I mean, it's the politics of grievance, right? It's not really about governing. It's about just getting people riled up and saying the right things and parading the right bodies through the street. I want to be fair. What's the guy's name? Jeffrey Pierce, who's the special ops guy who I believe yeah. had some role in the video game. Yeah, he plays so Perry. Yeah he was fine and he's good and he looks the part and he's a cool, got a cool face in the background, but the scene where he's, he's who Melanie Linsky is acting against was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the best look for him to succeed in. You know, I imagine it was a little bit like Mahomes and Henny in the quarterback room. <laughs> where it's just like one, one of these people can do anything and the right. other one can stand there. That was a little bit of a, that was, that was a rougher moment and she, she made the most of it. I'm not sure. I, I could come at it from two different ways. I could take I could take you seriously or not seriously. No, I don't, say, really, I don't want you to no, take me seriously. I was joking, but I was also just like, you know, I would love to know more about this whole situation. I, the only thing, but I, but I mean it, I mean this sincerely. She does seem like a decisive leader, which sure. I feel like people wanted. The, the thing that I didn't understand is truly the, you changed everything. What? For who? Yeah, I don't I know. Guess. I mean, maybe given the fact that her brother had obviously like forgiven Sam upon his preceding his death or Henry Henry right? Henry Sam's sorry for, have forgiven Henry before he died maybe he was a little bit more of a like a politician and she's more of it, like a, a of a like a military leader I don't I don't I, know I, I think there's two tracks to look at this one is that my god these gourmet chefs are really doing wonders with these cheeseburgers like if you dig into some of the stuff like what was happening for the 20 years before 10 days ago right you know and how they did this and what life was like. And now all these neighbors are gunning each other down and delivering these heartfelt speeches. And it's fucking Melanie Linsky, who's just a great, 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 great actor, making everything seem more plausible and compelling. Yeah, I, there's another version where you're like, what now? <laughs> all for the set piece? You know what I mean? Like when they get to the house and there's one old man shooting at them and you get that moment of Joel saying, you know, don't make me do this. Then you yeah. see the gunshot. And then the reveal of the walkie-talkie. I was like, yes. I loved everything about that sequence. I loved it. 
Yeah. It was it was exciting. It was riveting. If you poke too long at it, you don't want to. That's all I'm saying. You know what yeah. I mean? It it, it is, and I, I know people think that I'm being overly critical of video games. I, I guys, I'm just an American guy. I like video games and Doritos, <laughs> the way they crunch in your mouth. But there is an the trick in my experience of you know, more recent generation of video games is that thing of like, it's open world, but you should be going this way. Right. And that's TV storytelling too. So that's fine. There was a moment when the hole opened and the horde came out. And I was like, that's that's good timing for Henry, but a bad look for everyone else. Kathleen's position papers are of no <laughs> value here. And then the fucking like boss level monsters came out. Yeah. Where I believe, let me check my notes here. I did write, what the fuck are we doing? You know, th- th- there was a vibe that I had where it's just like, it, it was as if someone like passed gas at like restaurant Danielle. <laughs> you know, it was just like. I disagree. Yeah, I thought it was just like, I, I thought are we sure we're doing enormous this? Enormous fungus covered MMA guy was yeah. definitely my MVP of the episode. <laughs> well, he's undefeated. <laughs> he is. He he had some of the same like Stanislavski method concerns about Jeffrey Pierce that I did. Yeah. And he, he acted on them. Um. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, it just, okay. I thought it was awesome. I thought it had elements of, and probably a little bit consciously so, elements of hard home, you know, where you think you're getting this one yeah. thing. We've known we should be thinking about the crater, but the sinking of the of the truck and the sound, I That's was like, cool. this is legit. I oh, love this. And the, and the little zombie girl backflipping over the backseat. Oh, yeah. The lack of sentimentality with the characters, you know, that we've met for two episodes. That's just... They're doing it right. I, I am absolutely, um, yeah, I, I, I don't really have any criticism about, about any of that. I, there's just these things that I sometimes still bump on, and, and, and I'd rather say that it's a testament to the, the, the quality of everything else that it, I don't really bump for long. But like when, when Ellie says, uh, you know, and some of the mushroom head ones that, that, that don't talk or whatever, and they're like, you saw clickers, and you could just sort of like see the trademark sign on the end of that word just flashing in the air. Uh, when did we agree as a failed nation that we all call these things the same things despite 600 mile distances? <laughs> yeah. You know? There was also a moment where uh, Henry says, um, that's dicey as fuck. And yeah. it made me oh. wonder, like, how do, f- like, w- what was the sort of alternate history of phrases? Because nobody said dicey as fuck in 2003, right? When the, right. When this sort of whole thing AF started. AF wasn't a thing, yeah. And when did we, like, I wonder how, like, language would have changed had there been a mushroom zombie apocalypse. Do you know what I mean? Wow. And there's no Twitter, so you're not shortening things, right? Like, you're not, there's not, like, this sort of mm -hmm. internet to real life interaction between language. Well, I do think that argument would be much more good faith. Just because, yeah, you know, definitely. It's just, just <laughs> definitely. clearly, just it seems like just, there was no divisions in the camp. <laughs> in the last but of do us. you think people are still being like, "Look at this hipster with his trucker hat," even though it's two thousand three? It's true. I mean, two thousand twenty three. <laughs> you know, like we're just frozen. Oh, that's that's the most depressing thing we've said yet. I guess the only other note I have is this is a, another value neutral observation. I think I hope the the Ellie Sam scenes at the end in the motel were beautifully done. They were beautifully mm-hmm. performed. It was a provocation, I think, to the contemporary TV viewer because there are still, I mean, I, again, I don't, I don't watch the amount of content that Chris Skinner and Ryan does, but, <laughs> you know, you do sit there being like, I understand what the show is, but they're not going to kill the kids. You know, like I, I, I didn't think. <laughs> Reader. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they They did. I, I was like, they're not going to, but it's, it, but it, you know, it, it played well against my expectations. It was beautifully done, great performances, really tastefully written. And I, I thought, I thought it was great. Stay up with me. She falls asleep. It was really lovely. Did with a you, were you under the but, impression? But, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Let me just say, I did have that feeling at the end of it, which is, why are we okay? Like just collectively, like, are we okay? Cause it, it's, it's, there's a nihilism to it that is that is that is rough. And I think and it's I, baked in though. I think it's baked it's in. It's baked in. And and as I've said from the beginning, and I was referring to this with Chuck last week, like I trust these drivers. I think that the the morality clause of this show is sound in my August estimation. I'm not right. dinging them, but it it 
there was just, it, that whole sequence at the end is so horrifically rotten. And this is the most popular show on television currently. That's well, that's not about ranchers in Montana. It's it, it, it's an ugly feeling, but one that I think maybe is worth pointing out and not saying that it's the show's fault. But it was it was rough. Did you get the impression, or what was your read on whether or not Henry knew Sam had been bitten? Like, the night before. Do you think that he was oh. like, this is, I'm going to give him his last night of like... Oh, I didn't... Oh, is that a take? I didn't think that. I don't think it was a take, but I, I, I thought it was ambiguous because of the way he responds to Joel being like, you can come to Wyoming I, with us. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'll tell him tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of felt like maybe mm. he was like that's really nice. You guys are really nice. We'll deal with this like obvious issue tomorrow or whatever. Like maybe we it's just possible. can't go with you, but I, it's possible. I, I mean, shout out to Sam who has clearly the same immune system that you do. <laughs> um, I, I, I would say that Sam was, mu- Sam, <laughs> Sam was more stoic from his fatal mushroom zombie bite than Patrick Mahomes was when TJ Edwards stripped him up. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, he didn't milk it. No, yeah. I, I, that was that was that was impressive by the little man. Well, why don't we wrap it up there? Because I feel like we really we got into the do bottom you, of it. But Chris, do you feel like have they used up both of their? Oh, but guess what? Pull down the clothing card. Like have we? Like no, because no, they get they to get, reset it. Like that's the thing that they do. So they're doing so well on this show. Not unlike Andor, every third episode can be the the like. Oh my god the take-home episode. You know what I mean? Yeah, but can they, but literally can they have another beloved character pull aside their clothing to reveal that they're doomed? Like, oh, I mean, it just seems like it's a reality of the world. Like, yeah, I guess fool me three times, but like, it works for me and I did not expect that ending. You know, I don't know if that happens in the game, but that certainly shocked me. I'm just very impressed. Like, the amount of media you're talking about consuming last night where you're you're checking Twitter, you're totally awash with Eagle's disappointment and you're watching the show and you're able to talk about it with the viral loads being what they are. This is this is the Jordan flu game. This is incredible by you. So that's what Sean called. I was on Big Picture today too. And Sean, Sean referred this to is your like, second podcast yeah. today? Yeah. yeah. Well, I gotta, you know, it, it, it gives me purpose. Otherwise, I'm just sitting in this room being like, I guess I'll walk over to this part of the room. Wow. I just I hope that people understand what you what you do for them. I hope I leave it all out on the floor. Um, Andy, it was great talking to you. We'll be back on Thursday. Maybe we'll catch up on Poker Face. I was wondering if you if might oh, be up I'd for like that. To. Uh, and thank you to producer Kaya for facilitating this as always. Uh, we'll be back. Yeah, Thursday. We'll have we'll have a bunch to talk about. Uh, it was great to see your face. Glad to be back in the United States. And hopefully, I'll get out of this room within the next ten days. Chris, stay positive. <laughs> I'm but, trying, but don't. But but don't. But don't feel better. <laughs> 